Welcome to this talk. So as the slides say, we're going to talk about transformers. And this talk's really going to be about transformers. It's not going to be a NLP um, chat, even though most of the stuff out there is for NLP with transformers. And you see, we're going to do it with text-based stuff. But the idea of the talk is that you can walk away really understanding the architecture and seeing how it can actually be applied to any type of data if you structure your problem correctly, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So without further ado, we'll jump into it. But just before we jump into it, I did hear a few moments of good hours by views. So like I said, uh, we are quite a new startup. We're doing a lot of R&D stuff. We're focusing on speed of deployment and market validation. And Transformers fits quite a lot into this due to the way in which we can use foundational models for everything going forward. And yeah, there's even a product called Llamas. So we're not a SaaS company. We're a large language and multimodal models as a service company. We do some traffic optimization and some energy solutions, which Quibus and Tiff talked about yesterday. But the main reason why I'm doing this bit of shameless marketing is because everything we do is based off of this architecture, basically. So I really think this is an important architecture to understand. You can't escape it. But in order to understand it, you sort of need to know the history of how it got there. So in today's talk, we're going to talk a bit about sequence processing pre-2015. We're going to talk about sequence processing post-2015, which was the year sort of attention that really came into the mix. We're then going to dive deep into attention because that is like, it's all you need. And then we're going to jump into the transformer architecture, how to structure a problem and just some cool transformer stuff to show it's not just chat GPT or NLP stuff that comes out of it. So for this task, uh, for this chat, this is the sort of task we want to do. We want to do a machine translation task where we go from English, our source language, which is in blue, to our Afrikaans language, um, which is in red. So going from leave the food in the oven because it is still raw to how the course and it went when it is not still raw. There's a bunch of ways in which you can do this, but the first challenge sort of to solve is given text, how can we actually get it into a model? So that's sort of the first thing we'll, we'll have to solve and really high level this is exactly what you do. Let's say you have your input text, like I'm getting converted into tokens. You simply split it into tokens. Each unique token has just an ID associated with it. And you use that ID to go look up a vector that represents that token. Now there is a few ways in which you can break up sentences into tokens. So let's say for instance, you have that sentence, don't you love being at Indaba X South Africa? The most basic way in which you can go break up that text into tokens is simply on character, where every single character you just break up and you do exactly like that. It's super efficient, but learning something from just the letter P is much more complicated than learning something from programming. So instead of dividing it up just at characters, you can do a word level um, tokenization, which is simply splitting on white space with a few added punctuation rules, like for instance, this does not that we know in with a positive and a T as a not. So just group those together, but otherwise just simply split it at um, like in the white, white space. But this might not be so efficient because there might be other ways in which you want to do this. And there might be a lot of hidden meaning within these characters. So another way in which you can do this is sub word tokenization, which is sort of just a mixture between character and word level where you train a tokenizer actually on where and what it should split on. And it's doing this based on the frequency of which characters appear together. So let's say, for instance, we're training a tokenizer on English corpus. It will start with just single characters everywhere. Then it will take your corpus, group them together, just do a bit of a frequency count until it's sort of happy with these groups of characters always appear together. So that will be a token if I see it. And what this allows to do is that, for instance, words like Indaba, which is not really a a English word, but if you want to use it in an English um, context, this tokenizer will break up this word into meaningful character groups that it is capable of understanding. And that's what you sort of see here in this tokenization, where Indaba is broken up into Ind, Aba, and X, where these sort of hashes just show it's part of the previous word. So that's sort of why you want to do something with this, so that when the random words start showing up, you can actually break it up into something the model will understand and it will learn something from. And there's an entire theory and everything on this. I'm not going to go too deep into this, but just sort of know these exist. And you can Google it afterward or ask ChatGPT. And 
we're going to sort of stick just with the word level thing going onwards. It's most easy. We just split on um, white space and we go forward. And just to recap again, we have an input text, we split it into tokens, look up IDs, and we fetch a vector that represents that text. And now that we have vectors, our models are very happy. And it's important to note now that there's structure to this thing we're breaking up. It's not just random vectors we have, there's actually a sequence of vectors now going from T1, T2, T3, T4, T5, T6. So it's a sequency problem we want to tackle. And normally what would have happened pre-2015, if you see a sequence, you think, ah, RNN, this is how I'm going to tackle this thing. And again, very high level, RNN, it takes the input and it generates a hidden state that's important that might fit into itself at the next time step so that it can generate a nice output yt and it's usually much more easier when we just sort of roll this a bit out so our rnn will work is we'll start with our first token going in it will go into the rnn it will process a bit it will kick out the output and it will kick out a hidden state that it thinks is important at the next time step to take in again a next input and the output something important that should pass on to the next time step input output and in a nutshell, that's how RNN works. And for this sort of machine translation task, what was done in the past, is you sort of structure this encoder decoder RNN structure, where you have an encoder RNN that takes your source sentence, where these, this, these words, remember, are broken up into vectors. You process them sequentially, where each time step when we encode this thing, it goes and generates a hidden state for the next time step that it thinks is important until at the end where we've encoded our entire source sentence and it now has a hidden state that can now start feeding into our decoder. So this H of T is the only information that this decoder then has, and it needs to use that to start um, generating this output in Afrikaans. And what will then happen is this hidden state will be the initial hidden state feeding into our decoder, and it will produce the output Ho. It will then feed in its hidden state into the next time step, and again, just process this thing sequentially until it sometimes predicts a stop token and you just stop. So this works super nice. And there's a few caveats with this that you might start seeing as wrong or not so optimal. Like let's say for instance, we had this step in a decoding process. We've decoded ho, we've decoded D, and the question is now what's the next word that should come out? Now I am Afrikaans, so it's quite easy for me to like read this sentence and know the next word should be cos. But I do this by looking at the, the source sequence and I see, oh, there's food. Oh, I see there's the word leave. I see there's oven. I see raw. I see all these things. And it sort of indicates to me that, oh, we're probably talking about food now. How do like keep the course in the wind? Like all, I use all of that information to process the sequence. But given like just the single H of T, this information that's super important at the start of your encoder might get lost over time. There's a lot of processing that happens since food when we get to this hidden state and what this decoder actually needs to do. And then this hidden state gets altered by this decoder as well. So we lose a lot of valuable information that might be super important for this decoding step. And sort of the main issues are we're compressing all the information and we're not making each decoding step unique. So we can improve it by making, don't com not compressing all the information and making each decoding step unique. And the most easiest way to not compress all of our information into one state is simply to not compress everything into one state and at each decoding step, save that step's hidden state into a hidden matrix that we can use for this decoding step. Um, I'm also just switching over to a easier sentence to decode otherwise like these pictures get quite long so we now want to just decode quickly i like attention so we process it we get our hidden state it feeds in get our hidden state and we save this then for the decoding step what we then want to start to accomplish is that we want like that when i had to decode the word food i looked at different things given the context of the word i'm about to decode and where i am in the decoding process so we want to bring this into this model to allow this decoder now to look at all of those encoded hidden states and say, this is what's important. This is what I need to pay attention to. And that's literally what attention is. It's a step that now allows our decoder to look at our encoder states and say, this is what's 
important. So let's say now again, we have our encoder decoder RNN in structure. We've passed our source sentence through our decoder and we have our hidden matrix matrices or our hidden matrix here. What we then do is we just take that final hidden state still to kick off this um, process of decoding. And then our RNN creates our current state of our decoder. Our current state of our decoder then goes into an attention block along with our entire encoder hidden matrix. And it produces a new context vector, which is this blue part that we append to the current state of the decoder. So not throwing away what the decoder has done already, just adding more information about the encoder to this field, but specifically adding information that's important for the next processing step to be able to generate the word hope. And then we just do this on and on where we have our decoder step, attention, context vector, decoder step, output, state, attention, context thing. And that attention block is the building block of transformers and this entire thing. Not a lot has changed since that attention block. So understanding this attention block really is like one of the fundamentals for today to understand. So it's three times to focus and like this is like one of those focus times. And it is quite easy to understand exactly what's happening in this attention block. So again, our attention block, it takes in our encoder hidden states as well as our decoder state. And it generates a new vector that's a concatenation of our current decoder state and context vector. And it just consists of three steps to get to that context vector. The first step is we need to actually maybe make the assumption of what is important for a decoder step. And the assumption that was made is the more similar a encoder hidden state is to the current decoder state, the more important it will be for the decoding process. And that's what this first step does. So we just go and we take our decoder's current state and we do a dot product with our encoder matrix and we get the scores for each one of these hidden states, which will be higher if these two are more similar. So that's the first step we do. And this is simply to sort of get to a point of saying, I think this is the most important part for this decoding step. What we'll then do is we'll just simply apply a softmax to that so that we can just make it sum to one. So then we get our attention weights. So attention weights is just the softmax of our calculated scores. And what we then do is we take those attention weights and we use it to do a weighted sum of our encoder states. So in doing this, we create a new context vector that is a weighted sum of all of the important things we think is important from the encoder. So let's say this thing really thinks A1 is super important. This might then be like 0.95. So we'll really focus on the word I when generating ACK or something like that. But the most important is calculate how similar you are to that encoder, do a softmax, and then just do a weighted sum and get your context vector. And then with this, each time step of that decoder has the required information it needs. And there's a few ways in which you can go and calculate those attention scores. The most basic one is the um, dot product that I showed there. There's the other version, the scale dot product, which is exactly the same thing. We just abide by the square root of the dimension of our vectors we're working with. And this just brings in a bit more stability to the system. So just when calculating the gradients, it just won't explode and it will stay a bit, bit more constant. Sorry for the pronunciations. Like I've tried this like a few times at talks. I always get it wrong, but wrong attention where we just sort of make the assumption that our encoder might be in a different space than our um, decoder state space. So what we then do is we just take a linear network and we feed our encoder state through it. And then we take the dot product between that new projected encoder state and our decoder state. And then there's a down attention where we concat where we say, we're not gonna assume the dot product is the correct way to get the scores. We're gonna let a neural network decide what is the correct score. And this was sort of the first version of this attention actually was this Adano attention that was introduced in that first paper in 2015. And how it works is you just concat the decoder's current state, the encoder state, you feed it through a nonlinear 10 inch network, and then you just feed it through a more, and then you just do a dot product again, or yeah, you just feed it through another linear layer to get your score. So you let us learn what is important instead of enforcing this dot product assumption thing. But going forward, we're just going to use the scaled dot product. 
I might not always show I'm dividing by the dimensions. Just know everywhere, if, if you see a dot product, sort of just assume we're dividing by the dimension of this thing. So that's the way in which you can calculate sort of these similarities and the attention of our thing, where the attention weights are then just the softmax of our attention scores. We've calculated. So we sort of solved two problems we have then with our encoder, decoder, RNN setup. We're not compressing everything into one dimension more because we have our hidden matrix and each decoding step is now unique due to this attention mechanism we brought in generating the decoder step. But there is still something that's a bit missing and this is simply due to the RNN architecture. At each step of RNN architecture, it doesn't have all of the information it needs when it's generating that hidden state. And what I mean with this is, let's say I'm an RNN and I need to encode my knowledge about token food. The only knowledge that encoder has when it's looking at the word food is leave the, because we're going in a sequential manner through the data, where the ideal setup would actually be if when I'm encoding the word food, I have the entire sequence to look at, because I might want to look at oven, I might want to look at raw, I might want to look at because, and that can't happen with an RNN. You can sort of tackle this a bit with bi-directional RNNs, where you sort of go through the sequence from both sides, but you sort of end up still a bit with the same situation. Even if you come from this side, is will still only see still and raw, and food will see the and leave. There's never that overlap of I'm seeing everything at once. And that was sort of the main motivation of where the transformer came in. So the transformer literally is an architecture that uses all of this that we've learned before, like don't throw away all your hidden states, make each decoding step unique, but it brings in an architecture now that processes that encoding step, everything in parallel. So when I'm encoding a word, I'm looking at everything and taking all of the information I need from it. And it just repeats that process for a few layers instead of just one sequence of RNN running through. And we'll go deep into how this transformer works and We'll sort of start, start with self-attention, but just before I get self-attention, just any questions on the RNN thing and why we brought in attention? Um, just that motivation for attention is quite important when looking at transformers. So if everyone's happy. Okay, we're happy. Okay, cool. So for transformers, like attention is what we're going to use, but because we want to now use this entire source sequence to look at or to encode our tokens we need to bring in a different just a small but different attention mechanism than the attention mechanism we saw because we don't want to compare two sequences of tokens now with each other in the attention thing we want to look at our entire source sentence and then use that to see what's important from myself to send forward to this decoder and for that we'll use self-attention and basically what self-attention allows is that when I'm looking at the word food, I should pay attention to leave the it's still raw in my sentence. But when I'm looking at leave, I should only look at food in the oven because that's the only place where I should leave it. I don't, and food is what I have to do. But leave doesn't have that much importance with raw because it's a bit, but that's the most thing that you need to focus on for when looking at leave. And self-attention allows that. And self-attention is basically the exact that's the attention we looked at. It's just built on. It's just built on query keys and values. Now, I'll get to a nice definition. Query keys and values. Just it's like the first time I ever saw it. It's like why are we bringing in new terms and stuff? But basically, to sum up, is self attention consists of breaking up your input se sequence into three different sequences to allow it to look at itself from sort of different angles and ask the attention mechanisms questions about itself. You can't just take your sequence and do a dot product of yourself. You'll just end up with a diagonal and it will always be myself is the most important. So you sort of need a way to break that, break that mold. And it consists out of three steps. So let's stick again with our I love attention example. We take I love attention, we generate our input vectors, x1, x2, x3. We take that input vectors or our hidden state or whatever you want to do it for now and you feed that input into three different linear layers our query network our key network and our value network to generate new representations of our input se sequence in terms of queries keys and values 
What we then do is we go and apply that exact same attention mechanism we saw in the decoder, where instead of just taking different sequences and using those inputs, I will take, let, let's say we want to create a new context vector for when I'm looking at X1. I'll take Q1 that represents X1. I'll do a dot product of all the key tokens. I'll get the keys that are important for my, um, to know something about myself. I'll apply softmax to get my self-attention weights. And then I'll do just a weighted sum of the values to get a new representation of X1 that is now consisting of information about the sequence it was in, just much more rich now. Like it, it will contain, for instance, if it was the word leave, much more information about the tokens from oven, et cetera. And to sum up basically then this weird query key thing is that queries allow are there to ask the attention mechanism, give me anything you think is important to understand more about myself. Key is used by the attention mechanism to say, these values are the information you need about yourself to learn something. And the values are simply the information that the query needs to understand itself better. Like this made me understand it a bit better, but yeah. So just to recap, like the steps for self-attention is get your vectors, get your query key and value matrices, do attention like we have it, dot products, see what keys are more similar to yourself with again, the assumption that the more similar, the more important, get your attention weights and do a, a weighted sum of the values that's linked with those keys. And you have a new representation of that vector that contains the information needed for a task. And those query key and value matrices are, are networks that can literally be learned so it's not just randomly initialized, it will learn over time what are the values and keys. Like, where should I project these tokens to to make it work for the task? And just something also quickly I want to bring up is masked attention, like it will come up much more in the talk later, but there might be scenarios where I don't want my, key, my query to look at different keys. Like for instance, let's say we're in a generative process and like I can't look at the future if I haven't generated it yet. So don't look into the future and don't, don't change yourself based off of those tokens. Like that's sort of a scenario where you want to do masked attention or there can just be tokens you don't want the query to focus on. And in order to do masked attention, just do the same exact steps. Take your Q dot product of K, get your weights. And in this softmax step, the tokens you don't want it to pay attention to, you'll just put a minus infinity in and then you'll get zeros for it. And then in this weighted sum, those tokens won't have an influence. So you're not cheating by leaking some future information in or some secret tokens that it's not allowed to see. So yeah, that's just masked attention. And like, let's say we want to do this now for our encoder decoder part yet. How no masking will look like if we have an attention matrix is that when looking at token one, it will have an attention weight for itself for the other token and for A3 and again with itself with a uh, a2 will be able to look at everything and A3 will be able to look at everything. But in a decoding step, A1 should only be able to look at A1. A2 can only look at the piece three and A3 can look at basically everything when processing that step. And let's move on. And basically everything I said now is this famous picture from the 2017 paper, which sometimes is not so obvious when you're just reading this formula. It's not so clear that just by doing a matrix multiplication of a transpose of keys and doing a soft max and doing an other matrix multiplication is actually calculating similarities and looking at actually what's important for yourself when doing self-attention. And yeah, this is basically then what it is. But the nice thing then about how that attention mechanism works is where we just did a dot product with itself, that can be done simultaneously for all queries. So it's just matrix multiplication stats happening the whole time. It's not the single vector dot products we're doing. It's just doing matrix multiplications and we can parallelize everything. So that's just why we're showing it in this formula as matrices and not as vectors. But in essence, we take our query matrix, matrix multiplied with our K matrix, which is a dot product values. We scale it with the size of our vectors, apply masking optionally, do softmax, and then just do a weighted sum. And then we have a new representation of our input matrix, which was, which we used to create these QK and V matrices. 
And that brings us then to attention. So we have all the basic ACH transformers. So we have all the basic building blocks then for what we actually need to go and understand each and every one of these blocks that form this picture, which once you know what's going on, it's a super clear picture, but sometimes it's not so such a clear picture, just seeing words and blocks and arrows flowing around a bit. So we're going to dive deep into each one of these blocks, understanding these blocks on its own, and then seeing how all of these blocks actually work together. Just the one important thing to know when looking at this image is that this transformer architecture takes in sequences of tokens and it just transforms those tokens and outputs new versions of those tokens. There's no loss of shape or anything to your input that goes into this encoder. You'll just push through a bunch of tokens. It will get transformed a few times and you'll have your output tokens there. And those tokens then feed into this decoder, which again, just takes a sequence of tokens, processes them and has the same output shape as your original input. So just keep that in mind that with this entire picture, it's tokens flowing through this thing just continuously like that. But yeah, let's dive into all of these blocks or more just before I do, any questions on self-attention, anything wasn't clear, um, because we're gonna repeat self-attention a bit here. Awesome. So the main building block of transformers is this multi-head attention block, which you can see, here, and you can follow along here in the top corner of each block we're looking at now. So we're looking now at the multi-head attention block. And this is sort of the most important block to understand for transformers, because this is the place where attention comes in and where the name attention is all you need came from. And it's quite a simple process actually, where that self-attention mechanism we explained, we just do that multiple times. And then we can get the answers and we have our new representations. So it's, it's, it's really actually quite simple and we can break it down a bit into this graph. So let's say we have our input tokens X. So again, like our, I like, I love attention vector. Each one of these rows represents our input token. What will then happen is we'll just have multiple heads of it that does self attention that I explained earlier. So we'll take our input we'll feed it into head one, which has its own query key and value transformations. It will create new um, query key and value representations of our X. It will go into scale dot product attention and it will generate the new input version. We'll take X again, feed it into head two, feed it into different query key and value transformations, get different query keys and values, feed that into scale dot product attention and get it output. And then we'll just take all of these outputs, we'll concat, concat those outputs row-wise, and we'll just feed that new formed matrix through a linear projection just to get the same shape as our original input. But, and that's, that's multi-head attention. We take our X, we feed it into different heads, each one of its own query key and value matrices, producing different query key value matrices, goes into scaled up product attention, get your outputs, concat them, feed it into a linear layer and you have your new representation. And the reason we do these different sort of heads is the same reason we do multiple kernels in a CNN. Like when we have a CNN, we, we don't just have one kernel in each layer. We have multiple kernels going over our image, hoping to extract different features that a model can use. And this is the exact same thing we're doing here. We just have multiple heads of attention doing different self attention things, hopefully finding different things to look at when for this context. And it just allows more rich information to flow through this transformer, this multi, multi head attention. Um, one little engineering caveat that some might have seen is that the output of these different heads, query key and value matrices, the dimensions of our vectors, they are a bit different than the input um, dimension. So what we usually do, and this is simply just for more for engineering um, reasons versus machine learning reasons is that when we take this X and we feed it into different heads, we just ensure that the size of our dimensions that comes out here is our original input size divided by the number of heads. And then by doing this, the amount of computation that, like let's say we add 20 heads and we have a like, big input vector now, we add 20 heads, we divide that vector's size by 20 and we do our scaled up product tension over multiple heads, if we did reduce that size, 
it's the exact same computational complexity as though we only had one head. So we can go and extract all these all this extra information without adding any like complexity to our complications, complexity to our computations. And then we just concat them and feed it through a linear layer. And that is multi-headed tension. And then we just do this for multiple layers and keep on extracting information and information because deep learning, going deep, more information, it's it's a trend. So we just do that. And what I just showed again is this formula that you see in the 2017 paper. And hopefully it makes a bit more sense now where multi-head tensions takes in these matrices. It feeds it into different heads, which we concat, and we do a linear projection of that concatenation. Another small caveat that's an engineering thing more than a machine learning thing is that our multi-head attention takes in a query key and value matrix. So what we do in practice is instead of having those different query key value matrices, we have one query key value matrix. It takes in our input and it produces just the same output shape that there is normally. And what we then just do is we literally just break that final QKB vectors up into different things and they all go and into different heads and different scale dot product attentions. And if you're working as projecting down to a level and for computational complexity reasons, we do that. And that's why this multi head thing just shows QKB. So that's multi head attention. Um, just before I move on, is there any questions about multi head attention? The, the rest of the blocks are super easy. Like this one is by far the um, most important sort of block to understand. And just want to make sure everyone is feeling okay with multi head attention. Uh, <laughs> you, you randomly initialize and then you learn them over time. Yeah. Yeah. So it will learn what it where it should project and what projection space it should be to solve a given task for a transformer. Yeah. Okay. So let's move on. So that's multi head attention, and that's Weirdly, the only place in a transformer where attention happens is much more than attention. It's not all you need, but it's the, the feature extractor that's super important. And we'll get to the add and warm blocks now, but first just want to talk about that feed forward block that you always see in those blocks. And the feed forward block, the only job sort of of this thing is to make sense of what just came out of the multi head attention and prepare it for the next block that it's going to feed into. Like there might be a bit of noise coming in, there might be some similar things. Um, we don't know black box, but we just take this normal two layer MLP. We take each token on its own and we feed it through a two layer normal MLP network to produce a new token representation. So in this thing, there's no interaction between tokens. We simply feed in tokens through a network just so that the network can prepare it for the new block to feed into. Um, a interesting thing that they also did in this thing for engineering reasons versus machine learning reasons is that this two layer network, the middle layer is a super wide layer. Like let's say normally your token dimensions is like 768, but this DFF layer can be super wide, like 15,000 is sometimes like the depth of the width they go with this layer. And the reason they do that is because it's more computationally it's less computationally expensive going wide than going deep. And you can sort of prove that going this wide is almost the same as adding a few more layers in this block. So they sort of just did this work around to get deep near, a deep feed forward network in there by just going wide. So that's a feed forward block. Take your tokens, make sense of them for the next input. And then the other block that is in our normal encoder and decoder blocks is this add and norm block. So because we usually go quite deep with these transformer blocks, so each one of these, so each one of these blocks can like be appended to each other. So they feed into each other and that goes deep. And each one of these blocks has layers as well. So we really go deep if you add up all the layers together. And as we saw with ResNet, HighwayNet, all those things, we need to add a residual connection just so gradients can flow, grow through, ugh, come through nicely and we can just do a bit of better training 
And what we also do is we just normalize each of these tokens um, with layer norm, again, just to stabilize the network a bit. So this add and norm block is much more just for stabilization than anything else. And just out of interest, this layer norm block, it takes in each token, it just normalizes the token normally, but then there's a scale and um, shift variable that's also in this, these layer norm blocks that takes the normalized token, multiplies it by a value and adds that beta value. And these two parameters are learned during training as well. And there's a super interesting paper out as well, like I think it came out like two years ago or something, where they took a pre-trained network, froze everything except those scale and um, shifting parameters and only trained those. And they could get it to complete, completely different new task, sort of same domain, but completely new tasks it could learn to do. Um, basic tasks, like it could do an OR gate, now it can do an XOR gate. Stuff like that, but quite cool that there's so much information sort of in this bias at step thing and just this add and one block. And then sort of the final piece of the puzzle is the positional encoding block that happens at the start of that encoder. So like what makes the RNN nice is that inherently order is in it with the way it processes everything sequentially. But a transformer, like I said, everything is just happening in parallel. It's just matrix multiplications happening everywhere. So a transformer has no idea what's the relative position between tokens. And let's say we have this sentence, I have to read this book, versus a sentence, I have this book to read. It's exactly the same tokens. And if the transformer doesn't know anything about positions, both these sentences will have exactly the same output. But in real life, like these are two completely different meanings to the sentence. So in a way, we have to force position into this transformer network. And it's actually quite simple how they did it, is they literally just take your input tokens and they add a positional vector to each one of these tokens. So your first token will get position one added to it. Your second token will get position two added to it, third one, position three, et cetera, et cetera. And it's not a concatenation or anything. It's literally just a summation of different um, positional tokens. Now, these positional tokens has a bit of characteristics that will make them perfect tokens. Um, there's a lot of methods to do this, and not each one of them is perfect. But ideally, each time step should be unique and deterministic. Like, you should know the position, and position 2 can't be the same as position 900. Otherwise, some funky stuff could start happening. So, unique, deterministic. The distances between these vectors you add should also stay constant, like jumping from one to two, shouldn't suddenly push your token in that direction. It should just like sort of push everything in the same direction. And the way in which you create these um, positional encodings should sort of be able to generalize to super long sequences. Like because the transformer can handle, technically speaking, or not technically speaking, but it can handle varying lengths of input you want it to be able to generalize to any length of input you add in. So it should just be a method that keeps on adding positional tokens, no matter how far out you go. And the method they created in the 2017 paper sort of does exactly this. So how they add this positional encoding is by using this um, formula above, where you simply take alternating values between sine and cosine waves, depending on the index of the vector you're building up and the position you're adding to. So the first time it was quite weird for me looking at this, knowing exactly what's gonna happen, but breaking it up sort of into these and plotting sort of these sine and cosine waves, it starts making sense because the frequency of these sine and cosine wa waves are determined sort of by this denominator and then the position, the, the, the top one says where in this cosine or sine wave I'm gonna sample from. So Let's start with like position zero and we want to build out this positional encoding. Like D will then be zero. So it's the whole time sine zero, cos zero, sine zero, cos zero, sine zero, cos zero. And we can see there we sample our positional encoding vector. So when it's zero, we'll sample from the sine wave. When it's one, we'll sample from the cos wave. When it's, and we'll just alternate between sampling from these frequencies. When it's position one, that will be one and we sort of just shift a bit in our sine and cosine waves and we sample, sorry, this mouse is pretty, oh, that's good. We just sample from these points in a plot and we have our new vector. Um, 
I realize I made a boo boo, like those two are exactly the same, but like positional three, we just do exactly the same thing again. And that's how we can sort of sample these, these things. And it's quite straightforward. And if you see it and quite powerful, if you think about it, that this super simple technique of just sampling from sine and cosine waves allows the transformer to know the difference between those two sentences I just showed. So that's how positional encoding works. And now we're sort of here with this transformer. So we've went through basically everything there is in the encoder block that takes your talk, your source sequence and encodes it. So we've covered multi-head attention, we've covered add and norm, we've covered feed forward, we've covered add and norm, input embedding, we've covered how we add a positional encoding. So all this we sort of understand now. There's only like these, the mask multi-head attention, we, that might not be so clear. This weird thing where your encoder starts getting into this multi-head attention and sort of what's happening here at the top. How do we actually train these models? So we'll dive into the rest of these now, but just quickly, the mask multi-head attention is based, it's the exact same as this multi-head attention I showed here. It's just a masked version of it. So like that example I showed, because we're training these models and we have the data that it needs to do, we speed up training by just feeding in everything at once. So in this decoder step, the answer is already being fed in of what it needs to generate. So we'll just apply a masked attention so that it can't look in the future when it's generating the answer. So that's basically all that that is. This second multi-head attention block is where it gets quite cool and quite powerful. And in this step, cross attention is starting to happen. So this is now sort of that exact same attention block we showed with the RNN autoencoder decoder where we now bring in the source and the target together. So what will happen is we'll do the exact same thing we did in all of the other multi-head attention blocks. We'll just, we'll just make our query be the decoder tokens that's come up to that point, and we'll make our keys and values our encoder outputs. That's the information that the encoder thinks is important for the decoder to know. And then simply what will happen is the, the decoder is asking the attention, give me the information I need and here is what I am. Now give me what I need and let's move on. So we apply this cross attention mechanism. And with that, we literally now understand transformer encoders, decoders, and how tokens can flow, um, flow through them and how we can get the information from the encoder that's needed for the decoder. Um, and just before I move on to actually how we train these things, that's sort of the last part of this puzzle. Just want to make sure if everyone is fine and happy with these blocks and sort of the self-attention mechanism where we first feed in our, our source language tokens through our encoder. It does its things, its things, its things. It produces a encoder, it produces the transformed input tokens. We take that and we feed in our decoder tokens. That mask multi attention sort of makes sense of its own what input that's coming in, then we combine the two, and then we just feed it through again. And this step happens at each and every decoder step that's happening. But yeah, just quickly, is everyone happy with these separate blocks? Yeah. Um, depends on the task. Like in this one, it will be English, Afrikaans that's going on and we know these two are linked with the training data. So we'll just feed all those tokens in like that. But um, I'll get to a few more examples of other ways in which we train and we'll see how we can utilize those blocks. Okay. So yeah, so we have a way of transforming tokens now, but how do we actually tell the transformer this is how, we sh how you should transform your tokens? And we do this sort of with this autoregressive function. So remember, the task was going from one language to another language, given our thing. So we can formulate this in this autoregressive manner, where the task of the transformer is predict the next token, given the previous like decoder tokens you have, as well as all of the input source tokens there is. So what will happen is you'll take I like attention, feed it through, get your new tokens, feed that into each one of these decoder steps, we'll have the answer when training it. So we have the correct translation when we want to train, 
we'll just shift that sentence to the right and add in a new star token. What we'll then do is we'll feed it through. The, trans the decoder will transform everything to solve this task, and we'll have these new output um, token representations given these inputs. And the task is then simply to predict the next token. So remember with how we tokenize these things, each one of these words is actually a integer value that links to a token. So the task here is that given the star token, predict the correct token ID for act. Given the act token ID, predict the correct token ID for home. And we can do that with a simple softmax layer where each token is just represented by that softmax layer and we just do cross entropy. So feed it through. Remember, shift it to the right. So start should get ACK, ACK should get HO, FAN, VANDAG, ANDAG, and then predict a stop token. And then we can just do cross entropy with that. And we can do all of this in parallel, speeding up training significantly from RNNs, where every process is like process, 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 new word, everything from the start. Here we feed in everything at once. And because we have mask multi edit attention, we don't cheat, but we just feed it through and we get our training done. And this is literally how it was done. So very simple task, but super smart architecture decisions, linking what was wrong with her attention to fix it in a transformer. And by doing this, we've come now to where we are 2022 based off of this initial things they did in this paper. And this is how you can train this model. And once this model is trained, like this is how you can input something like this in production. So let's say we have this new sentence coming in. We fed it through our decoder. We have our um, change tokens that feeds into all of our decoder steps. And we have our start token where this, sorry, I forgot to mention it. This start token is like just a fixed representation. Like this is the representation that the start token is. We feed that in, we generate a token and we have the word act. We then take that that we pre predict uh, generated there and just append it in to the input of our next decoder step, feed it in softmax MLP, get the thing, feed it in, get the thing, feed it in, get the thing, feed it in until it predicts the stop token. And then we say we're done. And we just take those words that we started to predict. And this is how you can use this thing then in production in real life. And yeah, quite cool. But most of the transformers today, so that's sort of then how transformers work. Like, let's actually go back. So does it make sense how transformers work? How, yeah? Uh, just one question. So I see it on this four decoder. Is there one decoder that oh, sorry, yeah. all the weights and then it is duplicated across the inference? Uh, no, yeah, sorry. Thanks, yeah, that was just a bad drawing for myself. So. There's the there's se separate decoder layers. So we just rep, we do the same process, this block of blocks. We do it multiple times, but it's different weights. It's just like different CNN layers being added together. So it's not copy paste the different decoders. It's just these blocks repeated multiple times. And that's just an architecture. That's an architecture thing. That's just deep learning. Like let's add layers. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. That was just by coincidence. Yeah, sorry for that. Yeah, yeah, just by coincidence that it ended up now before. But each one of these is its own, like transformer block. Just put there together, and it's deep learning. We go deep, extract all the information that's needed, and do a softmax at the end to get your word. So that's transformer basically in a nutshell. But that architecture we see there was sort of the first transformer architecture, but most of the transformers we talked about today, like excluding a bit T5, which is like still heavily used today, are more encoder or decoder only models. Um, the, like we said, like the original idea with transformers was to solve machine translation. It wasn't to do anything that it's doing today. It was simply, let's do machine translation good. It was a Google wanted to do machine, Google Translate needed to be better. Let's do this. But over time, like people have used this architecture in quite cool ways. And it's sort of falling into two categories. There's encoder only transformers and there's decoder only transformers. 
And the only difference between those two is how they trained. But basically, we throw away that second decoder block. We, we throw it away and we just keep that first encoder block. And depending on how we train it, we can either make it the encoder. So just given this input, create a new representation or a decoder where given this input, start generating cool things like GPT-3. So BERT-like models, GPT-like models. And sort of how we can train these BERT-like models and how the first one was trained, which was BERT, is to think up new self-supervised tasks. So that's also a thing that this allows us now. We can start doing self-supervision on a massive corpus of data, and that's why these things started to work so well. And how the original BERT people did this is they devised the task for the model to solve where given this big text corpus, randomly sample sentences and just predict, is the sentence that follows this sentence the next sentence? Yes or no? And you know the truth by doing the sampling technique. So sample a few that do, does follow each other and just throw in a random sentence if it's a false that you need to predict. And how they then structure these tokens is quite cool by bringing in a lot more of these special tokens, like the start and stop token. So what I did is I added this classifier token at the start that is used to make the final prediction. They add in the tokens of the sentences and then they add in a separator token just to say this is now a new sentence that follows this. Learn to utilize the separator token to solve this task. What's then quite cool is because of this BERT-like model, so it's not a decoder, it's an encoder, attention is allowed to look at all of these tokens simultaneously. So this classifier token can go and look at all these tokens, bring all of the information that's important to solve this task into that one token and say, predict, is it a next sentence or, or not? And then you can train a model with this next sentence prediction thing. And what they also did is they did mask language modeling. So in, in what you do in this case is you randomly take out a few of these tokens and you put in a mask token for them. And then the goal is to just given this mask token, predict what was the correct token ID that was in there. So in that way, it starts to see how sentences should start interacting and it can do inter-sentence, intra-sentence sort of discovery by doing this mask language modeling, by looking at what's next to this thing, what's next to that thing, some of what's even in that other sentence and just learn language. And then you can take the, these bird models that, so you pre-train it in this self-supervised manner where you can go massive data corpus, make it sort of, I don't want to use the word understand because it doesn't, but it's easier to follow, but it understands language now. And then you can just go and fine tune it on different tasks like the squad, name identity recognition or anything by just utilizing those token outputs with a softmax layer or whatever you want and fine tune it on a different task. Um, this next sentence prediction thing was sort of dropped off the bird. There, there's like other transformer models now, like the Stillbird, Albert, like all those models. And they found, and basically the only difference between them and BERT is optimization techniques. And they've sort of found this next sentence prediction sometimes decreases the model performance. And a lot of the times it's just a useless thing to throw in. So they only do mask language modeling, but they do keep in this classifier token simply because you can then use that classifier token going forward for different tasks. So make it learn just to throw information into that classifier token, or what you can do is just average all the tokens if you really want to do other type of classification. Like, um, I don't know how many of you have played like with sentence transformers where you can encode sentences to be similar. What they do, and it's also just encoded transformers, is they take all sentences that, again, they have data sets that show these sentences are similar. They just encode all those sentences with tokens like the average of those tokens and just do simple contrastive learning, pushing similar sentences together and other sentences far away. And then you have sentence encoders. So these encoder models, BERT-like models are super valuable and quite easy to train. And sort of what I just want to show in this slide as well is just another recap because like these are what sort of was the AlexNet moment of Transformers is that you can pre-train language now and transfer learn with it. So again, you just have this pre-trained thing now. You can apply a simple mask to it. 
and predict what was the correct word, like I love ice cream was the correct word it should predict, pre-train it in this, but now you can go and quickly fine tune a sentiment model on this classifier thing. Or you can do named entity recognition. We have to predict, given this token, what is it? So you can, for instance, take in David works at ByteViews and <laughs> I only realize now David's actually enough. He was our first llama, like I used this when he was gone. Um, but David works at ByteViews and it can predict person and organization given what it's learned in other tasks. You can now go and do cool stuff like this. And then for GPT-3, GPT-2-like models, which is all the craze now, again, super simple self-supervised task you can do. You just, instead of having a attention mechanism in there that's allowed to look at all tokens, you just have that mask attention layer when training. So how you then train these GPT-3-like models, and what I'm showing sort of here is just, it's exactly the same as our encoders, where there's a masked attention model, add a norm, feed forward, add a norm, just big, multiple layers, but you take a big text corpora, feed in tokens, and it's supposed to then just predict the next tokens of a sentence. And then you can pre-train it in this way, and then you can take it into production, prompted with, for instance, just the tokens of the Lord of the Rings is, and then if it's well-trained, it should predict a cinematic masterpiece. And then you can just go on from that. And that's sort of just how GPT-3 is trained. The, the power of this GPT-3, and it's like, even though it's so simple, looking at it like this and thinking, oh, wow, cool, you predicted the next word is the scale. Like it is simply the scale. And my opinion is, I don't think we understand yet exactly why it is so powerful, just predicting the next word, but there is something in it. Like I think people denying it, should stop denying it basically it, there is something in it it's not going to do agi but there might be something in this predicting the next word and i think it's a very interesting thing to go investigate of exactly maybe how language works and all those things but that's my opinion and take word for it not limited not bite for his opinion um and just a cool thing then of just predicting this next word is this fact that you can actually now do prompt engineering with these sort of generative models so even though it just learned to predict the next word, it did sort of learn to take everything into context and then seeing what can happen. And you can actually zero shot prompt it or you can few shot prompt it. And like here, I'm just showing like a little example of zero shot prompting where I feed in English, the sandwich is very tasty, Spanish, that sentence, which I assume is correct. You just feed it in and then it just can go on and do this thing just by being prompted without any examples, but knowing this is sort of what you want. A cool thing that you can also do is like this few shot prompting where you sort of give it a few examples, like translate each sentence into a string of emojis, English, the cat ate the fish, emojis, like cat, like hungry facey fish. And that sort of represents that. And you can give a few examples of that. And then this is sort of the one you wanted uh, to prompt. And then it's like English, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And it can then produce these emojis given like these examples and sort of what you wanted to do. There's actually a real example that does work. Um, so you can do cool stuff like this by just starting to predict the next word. And then just, um, this one is a bit outdated, I'm sorry. It's like early 2022 type vibe. So it's super outdated now, but um, these are just some of the famous transformers you can start looking at. And just to show, there are still encoder decoder models being used a lot, like especially T5. Um, if you've ever done QA of talk to a question answering system or a chat bot or anything like that, almost guaranteed there'll be a T5 in there. Um, so it's, it's, it's basically a cool encoder decoder model that's trained to solve tasks. And it's used a lot in question answering systems. Encoder on only models like the famous ones, BERT, Stilbert, Albert, Mini LM is also quite the one we like that's used a lot. Um, and decoder only models like GPT-2 and 3, Bloom, like what Jade spoke about um, yesterday a bit, which is actually a super cool thing where a bunch of people around the world sort of contributed together for resources to train a multilingual GPT that's at the same size as these GPT models. So sort of not limiting it to just this massive one company that can train these sort of models, but open sourcing it now and allowing everyone to look at the way it's start interpreting why is predicting the next word doing so good? What is in it, especially looking at the multilingual type of sensor? Bloom is a cool one and Transformer 
Excel is also one some a lot of people use. Um, and the other cool thing about transformers is like hopefully now, but like understanding that transformers is not a NLP model. It's a sequential model. You can start utilizing that knowledge to do it with any other types of modalities. Um, it's, it is basically written now in any modality, but like just want to highlight these few ones. Like you can do it with images where the sort of challenge with getting into other modalities is just thinking, how do I get what I want to do into a token? Like that's once you can think how to get something into tokens, you can throw a transformer at it. And that's exactly what sort of these vision transformer people did for the, the vision transformer model. They just took an image, broke it up into different patches, flattened those different patches, fed it through a linear layer, and then you have tokens of your image now. And what I then just did is I added a classifier token at the start with a zero position, and then I just add positional encoding so that the transformer again knows that, and you sort of just stick with a standard and the transformer will learn how to do it, but the first position will be like the top left corner, second position, third position, four, third, six, seven, eight, nine, just so it sort of knows where these images are from each other. Then you just throw it in a transformer encoder and train it on ImageNet, and it does super well. It broke a lot of records, and there's been a lot of progress actually in vision for transformers now. Like this initial bit model was super cool, but basically limited to only a classification model. You couldn't do anything with it. It was super slow to train, not so easy to work with, but there's a lot of work that's come out now, like with the Swin transformer. That's sort of bringing in a bit of convolutional priors into it again, where you only allow certain attention, pat oh, you only allow attention to look at certain groups of patches, basically exactly like you would have with a convolution sweeping over, but only those patches now pay attention, next layer different patches, so a bunch of cool stuff. Um, read afterwards on it, like there's really too much to put inside. And for like reinforcement learning, you can then use like decoder only type of models where you train a sort of an off offline manner. So you can have a data set of reward states and actions that had happened. And you can just see that as a sequence problem. In this reinforcement learning case, you have the reward that came in and then the next state of the environment and the action that was done, the reward state action and sort of what you can then just do is feed in the reward and the state and make it predict the action, just like a decoder fashion. By looking at what has happened, it can sort of learn what's the ne next action that can be, and you just sort of let that thing run. And there's, again, a lot of new stuff that has come out of it, but these are sort of the first ones for it. And just to show sort of how different ones can work together, like a, a famous example of how audio was used together was in like, you know, the we have to vec paper that's on Facebook. That's like a real state of the art for like encoding and generate uh, for transcribing text, uh, speech. What you then do is like speech is quite a hard one to get into a token. Like it's thousands of features you sort of have to get into a thing. And what they then did, which was quite smart to get it into tokens, was slide a 1D CNN over this audio. And then each output of that 1D CNN is just your token that can then feed into a masked language encoder, and then produce a new token representation. I won't go into too much detail that they do it, but then they just do contrastive learning where far away you can use tokens to predict the next token. And if you're able to predict the next token, you sort of learn how audio works. But the idea is that you can combine these different things all together into a single thing to get to a place. And transformers allow all this and they work super cool. And another super cool thing, if you use sort of this, um, cross attention we talked about is you can start bringing in other modalities and start making modalities speak to each other using that cross attention thing. So this is like one of the very cool papers, the, the bull bird, the vision and language bird model. And basically what happens here is you have two separate transformers for each of your images and your language, but you then feed your images and your language through it. But then every now and then you do cross attention between these two different transformer blocks where in the one, your image will be your query and your language will be your key values, and in the other one, your vision will be your, your language will be your query, and your vision will be your values and your keys. And you just let them communicate like this. And then at the end, you can feed in images, you can feed in text, and now you have image representations that knows about text. You have text image representations that knows about vision. And then you can do super cool things going forward. And just something that 
like I quite like a bit about it, like productionizing, how can we optimize these models? Like there's a bunch of work that's also gone into optimizing this attention mechanism because it is sort of now, it has become the cornerstone of a lot of products, a lot of companies, a lot of research, attention has become a cornerstone of it. And the issue of attention is it grows exponentially complex for each token you add, because for each token you add, it now needs to do a dot product of all other tokens. So it grows exponentially for each token that you start adding. So a lot of people have started looking at ways into optimize this and sort of one way is global attention. So let's say this is like your attention matrices, all I show you. And what global attention does is says, I'm just going to use like one or two tokens that all my other tokens will attend to. And what sort of can happen is, so this will be the only attention matrix you have and all these won't attend to each other. But sort of this one can attend now to no, that one, can attend now to that one by sort of flowing all the way through there and through this global um, optimization thing, even though we're only looking globally at a few of these tokens. The other one that you can do is like band attention where I make the assumption that close by tokens are the most important one and I only attend to like a few of the tokens close to me. You can do dilated attention, just like dilated CNNs, where you just add a bit of sparsity into it. Again, just to sort of spread that width I'm seeing of the context. You can do random attention, which doesn't work on its own, but you can combine it with other things, but you'll see now random attention is used and you can use blocks, just like again, making that assumption. All these close things are important to myself. But the cool thing with this is like you can bind all those attention optimizations into different things like the star transformer that used band attention and global attention together long former which was like one of the first real ones that worked on much longer sequences that combined this band attention with like this middle sort of global attention etc then band global and then big bird which is sort of now the state of was like sorry like it's two months like was the state of the art for um like this attention optimization thing where i combined sort of this band and global thing, but with this random attention thrown in. And they actually showed theoretically that this setup of this random attention along with all these other things is identical to a full attention. You're, you gather enough information identically to um, doing full attention, which is quite a cool thing. And this big bird now allows you to go super long. So before stuff like this, like 1,024 tokens was pushing it for transformers. and Let's say you want to encode the entire book that could be hundreds of thousands of tokens for certain books, but you, you can't and you want to attend over all of that to get a book representation. But by allowing things like this, you can now start getting there. Like we can now start working with like 4,096 tokens, for instance. Quite cool stuff, um, this thing. And I put this in last night just because everyone talked about it. <laughs> it's like ChatGPT, how does ChatGPT work? Um, most likely all you need is an instruct GPT. So this is, um, and OpenAI says it, definitely there's a few caveats, they don't mention it, but most likely it's a massive um, instruct GPT that is chat GPT. And um, how instruct GPT works, there's a cool paper you can read on it. Um, so it's a bit small there, but like training language models to follow instructions of human feedback. Like if you read that paper, you should, you'll basically understand how chat GPT works. But the idea of that paper is how can I make these outputs from GPT-3 by prompting it fit with what humans expect? So just aligning what humans expect from these models. And how they did that is they first gathered a big data set. So they sort of just sampled prompts from a data set where this data set is prompts that people have fed to GPT-3 with like the playground and the API. So they take those prompts, they feed, they give those prompts to laborers where they go and write what they would have written for that prompt. So getting that human label, and then they just fine tune GPT-3 on these human outputs. So given this prompt that feeds into GPT-3, train it to predict what this labeler wrote. And then what you can do is now given this fine-tuned GPT a bit that now is following a bit more humans, you can collect um, even more valuable data by training a reward model. So what they then did is they took this um, same prompt, 
they fed it into GPT-3, made it stochastic so that it generates a few prompts. And then they gave those various prompts to human laborers again, which ranked those prompts in order of worst to best alignment to this thing, and then feed fed that into a model to start training a reward model that given these prompts will predict which one is most aligned given this prompt at the start. And then given all that data they have, they just train GPT-3 using PPO. So then it's just giving a prompt, generate the output, feed that output into our reward model, a reward model, a reward gets generated, and you just fine tune GPT using the PPO algorithm. And doing that, you get to chat GPT, which from all of the models that has been released feels the most, oh, it, it understood me, but it was actually just trained most likely on something you saw and comes a bit from it, but quite cool. So yeah, for those that was you and wondering how chat GPT works, in a nutshell, that is how it works. Most likely just a, a like they do say it actually a 3.5 GPT. So most likely like a bit more than 175 billion parameter model. Um, this, this paper, this training language models to follow human feedback do show the results for 175 GPT, 175 billion parameter GPT, and it's not as good as chat GPT now. So it is definitely a more scaled, more data type of thing they did. But the cool thing actually from this Instruct GPT is they also show for a super small model how it is on par with GPT-3 by bringing in this human feedback loop. So, yeah, that's Transformers in a nutshell. And thank you. <laughs> so, any questions? Um, they never did specify it, but my assumption with those that when I read it is again an engineering choice and not a machine learning choice. By concatenating it, you'll again just make that vector much bigger and much more compute than needs to happen when doing those computations. So rather just add it onto it so you don't bring in bigger vectors that need to be multiplied together and just assume the transformer will learn to extract sort of that positional encoding directly out of it with like a few of the um, networks. Um, it's like mostly if you go on Hugging Face and download the model, it will be 768. Like that sort of chat GPT and all those ones. Um, there's a few smaller models known as like 368 and stuff like that. Um, one thing I actually didn't talk about is um, a lot of times people also think transformers can only be these massive billions parameters. Like we have one that's 1.2 million parameters, which is nothing and it works. And like this architecture doesn't have to be this massive. Then you can start considering actually uncatting it and like not hoping it learns this position. Like here's the position, use it. So. It, it, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah, I think it was an engineering decision then, yeah. With the um, it seems like transformers are super useful uh, for these specific problems that you mentioned. Would there be value in applying them to much simpler problems like just basic data classification, um, make, yeah, basic prediction from a data set, um, and, and, and what is there any reason not to? Um, I think the only limitation would be if that input data can be broken up into like the sort of token token world, like if it can be broken up sort of into this, because it is a sequential model, it, it's not a just a thing. So if you can break it up sort of into the tokens, you can use it. And for instance, um, there's a 
so many papers I could actually add it to this thing, but it's like a, a new paper tab, tab PFN or PFN tab or something, but it's a transformer model basically that can now work on tabular data with this few shot method. So prompt it with your X data, your table data, and then predict my Y test data in a sort of generative man manner. It's a lot more to it. There's a bit of meta learning as well, but they've shown then, oh, look, transformer is a non-tabular data. But I think the, the one thing with all of this is if it can be broken up into a token, most likely you can do it. And it doesn't have to be a billion parameter model. It can be a super small two layer transformer. We do it. Most likely. That, that is exactly what they have defended. Yeah. So go for it. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, okay. uh, thanks. Uh, great to be um, this is a question on the exact change to what we wanted to study in the request for the same. And she <laughs> alluded a bit. I think the best is the attention weights. Um, like you, you can sometimes see, like we're putting a lot of our priors in when we're looking at those attention weights as well, and like searching for like that. Oh, obviously, it's looking at that thing when doing it. But so far, that's the best I've seen from it. Um, but then it also sort of becomes weird with like that one example where I showed where or talked about where it's layer normalization and only tune the the scaling factors of normalizing my vector. It shouldn't have this effect. So I don't think it, it's, I don't know. <laughs> like attention weights is the best thing and it looks pretty if you do it, but yeah, you could, there's a, um, a person at Oxford that did a PhD in training, oops, uh, training GPT to tell me why you're doing this. And that sort of sparked this entire thing of prompting. Um, it, you see it sometimes when we go on Twitter, right? like um, my laptop was plugging, do it quickly, but you can prompt GPT like blah, 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 explain step by step why you're doing this. And then it starts showing generatively why it's doing this thing. And that is maybe a next step versus just the attention weights. But it is a stochastic thing again, because it is just doing a beam search over different things but that could maybe help a bit in saying why it's doing it. A lot of the math stuff where they want to show it, it's like explain step by step and then suddenly it starts showing this is what I'm doing. But again, you, you don't know if it's, why it does, you, you want to put in that, oh, it's so beautiful, it's explaining, but it could just be, it learned to say this to you as well. So attention weights are best. <laughs> Sorry for the boring, crappy answer. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll share it. Um, I don't know where to. I'll, I'll put it on LinkedIn in the other X repost me. <laughs> yeah. So I have a question. Um, I think that you use ChatGPT and pass uh, a for exam, and also AWS application. I saw that one. Um, why would you say, given that it's passing this thing, why would you say it doesn't understand? Or why, yeah. Um, why, why is nature of prediction yeah. knowledge giving the... Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Make a controversial statement. <laughs> my opinion on this is if this thing came out 1940 we'd say this is a god this thing knows everything it is obviously ai it understands what it's saying but because we moved so step by step towards this thing it's getting so much and we sort of start learning with each of these steps that, oh this doesn't really mean understanding we're starting to say it doesn't understand but if it came out in 1980, I would tell you this thing definitely understands it. Give it AWS. It knows what it's doing. Now I sort of assume 
it can do it in certain cases, but I don't trust it in 95% or 5% of the cases. So I would say, and like we use, I can, I think we can use the word understand. It can understand certain tasks and do it, but they are 5% of charge cases where it won't. And are, are we happy with 5%? Yes, maybe, yes. <laughs> like, exactly. That's my argument I also make. Like it is a, like it's a weird discussion, okay. but like, when are we happy enough to say something is took a step closer, even though it's not what we want it to be, it's not romantic predicting the next word, but it did start doing something better than I could do it, start doing something better than, and again, my view is not company or something, um, but, uh, doing something better than a two-year-old can, doing something better than a three-year-old can, four-year-old, just differently. It's not AGI as in it's the brain, it's doing like what we're doing, but it's doing something. It might also be the wrong word. The model does something that resembles it solving a task. And can't we just be happy enough with that and not get into weird discussions? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I knew I shouldn't have said words. 